So I, I haven't been here for a while. I, before Jenny gets here, I just wanted to ask uh, uh, um, the, the the three of you that I think were in there the whole time, um, how, how's it looking on the R package front? Do you guys have an R package? Uh, I manage, in fact, plenty of them, but I do not own them. <laughs> I'm just like, the, I think like uh, I'm the sub one managing them, but uh, yeah, and they, they are a mess. Like you, you do not want to check them. <laughs> All right. um, Jenny is running late, FYI, but uh, she will be here. So uh, we have some time to <laughs> yeah. discuss, get some questions no. in, get questions up for you. John, how did this community start? It's so large now. Yeah. So I wasn't in the first group. Um, uh, Jesse Mustapak started it that uh, she wanted to read the book R4DS and she tweeted that, hey, I'm going to read it. Does anyone want to read along with me? And Hadley retweeted her tweet and it got like, you know, 10,000 views or whatever. And so she was like, oh, crap. <laughs> and then, so she started this thing. Um, and it started as purely like it was one book club. All the channels were just like the chapters of the book. Um, and then she did a second round of pulling people in. And that's, I think, when I came in and kind of it started to morph into more of a just like it's a slack. So let's discuss things. And um, I took it over that next August, I think. Um, and then during the pandemic, uh, Maya Gann suggested reading Advanced R together. And I was like, oh yeah, hey, that's what we are. We're, we were a book club to begin with. Let's do that again. And now I haven't loaded it, but more than 50% of our conversations are in the book clubs now. Mm -hmm. um, so it's we are more of a book club again than a, uh, than a help site. Yeah. And it's fun to look at the analytics because like you can see when there are big conferences because not just me, like someone will talk about R4DS at every conference. Yep, there we go. I can see that last week was uh, shiny count because we've got a big uptake yeah. in users. Um, and, uh, you know, like uh, Tan had a talk at shiny count last week. And so he talked a lot about R4DS and I, I had a talk and I talked about R4DS and um anyway and you see effect on the number of the people in the, the chat uh yeah so um slack has stats for weekly active members oh like, um people who are active somewhere in the week they have lots of other stats if we pay but <laughs> there's yeah. like no way that we can pay for slack because you pay per user and we have well, you, thousands you of them. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> that's, so, that's a good model. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, people have offered to donate money for us to have the paid version of Slack. And I'm like, no, it'd be like $10,000 a month. We're not going to do that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, you can see spikes. Uh, like that's got to be August 2021. What was... I'm not what sure what that was. Um, so every once in a while, it'll be that like um, that one might be the one. There's a spike somewhere in here where we did a uh, tidy Tuesday that was about wine ratings, and mm. there was a huge uptick on RDS from that because apparently that got shared around a lot on Twitter. Um, I, I, that's my best guess of where the uptick came from, at least. Uh, there's a big uptick in October 2020. Some of these are just like, you know, we have uh, Hadley joins a book club for one meeting, and so we get a bunch of people for that week. Um, but yeah, we've got pretty sizable uptick uh, from Chinese count. We'll see if that lasts. I mean, I advertise it's when I can, but yeah. It like it stays at the right size <laughs> like we seem to mostly keep enough people that the questions don't get out of control um 
every once in a while I have to do a call for, hey, we need more help with people um, to answer questions because we've gotten too many, like this could be one where we get too many new people. And I, I answer some, but I, I, I think Stack Overflow is the best place, but people like maybe I mean, Stack Overflow ask you to produce a reproducible example, which yep. uh, step the bar a bit high for a bunch of people, uh, which is problematic. I mean, I don't know what the good solution is, but yeah. My, my problem is half the time or most of the time, by the time I'm asking for help in the Slack, it's because I can't reproduce my problem. Yeah. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> That's a good so, one. I, yeah, so I think most of the things I ask, I get a little bit of discussion that gives me something to do, but I never quite get like a, a fully packaged answer, but I at least learn new things. So mm. I can't complain. Yeah. And sometimes you, you find the, the random guys that's run into the same issue and that, and that has the a solution. So you never know. Yeah. And sometimes you find the post on Stack Overflow from 10 years ago that yeah. had the same problem <laughs> and no answers. Yeah, and you that, just get very sad. That's happened a lot, like, especially like for old <laughs> package, old stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Jenny said um, she went on autopilot and was forgot that it was starting time. I had warned her that it's uh, <laughs> uh, daylight savings is the worst week. Yeah. But anyway, so she'll be here, but she uh, she had to get home. <laughs> Well, I'm always she, amazed by like, the Slack. So, yeah. I it is to me the one like as a as a kind of lone R user in a sea of non R users at my work. I feel like I rely on the Slack as the one place I think I can get things answered as opposed to being stuck. And I'm so impressed when I like post a question and like 60 yep. seconds go by and I've got three answers. It's <laughs> awesome. I'm glad to hear it. And Jenny is here. Hello. All Hi. right. Sorry. We will yeah, no problem at all. Uh, so uh, welcome everyone to the RPDS R Packages Book Club. Uh, tonight we are speaking with Jenny Bryan, one of the authors on the second edition of R Packages. Um, if you watch the authoring on GitHub, you can see that she's been doing quite a lot on the second edition. Um, she's also a software developer at our, or at Posit, um, and she owns Use This and uh, the like Gargle universe of packages and a whole bunch of other stuff that every once in a while I see. Oh, Jenny, Jenny runs that one now. Um, all kinds of very useful packages that I like a lot. And so welcome. We're very glad to have you here. Thank you again. I apologize for being late. I just went on autopilot and then I, I got out of a workout and I was like, oh my God. And then I saw you anyway. Sorry. No that. problem whatsoever. <laughs> uh, we, we had plenty to talk about while we were waiting. Okay. So. Yeah. You can talk about me in my oh, absence. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. And so this group uh, was forewarned that we would have a conversation with you at the end of the, the club. And so we have uh, a good good pool of questions that are actually like tagged to what chapter they were reading when they when they asked the question. And so okay. um, hopefully it'll give you some interesting uh, information. I know it's like not the greatest time for new interesting information <laughs> about the book because you're wrapping everything up right now. Um, but it's uh, still yeah. I'm like, if, if it's really good. easy to act on feedback, I want it. And if it's not, I want you to put it in an envelope and like put it on a shelf. Well, <laughs> and save, uh, save that for the third edition. No, seriously. Well, we'll have this as the uh, the extra resource that you can that people can refer to if you know yeah. if the book doesn't have what they need. So, um, so without further ado. Um, we've got one. I'm, I'm going to try. So I'm going to start with ones that are kind of associated with a chapter. We have. Am I a supposed to be looking at something? Nope. 
No, I'll just ask okay. you. You're going to just Don't surprise worry about, me. Okay. Yeah. I will. <laughs> I um, and then we'll have, if depending on timing, we might have a few that are kind of your workflow outside of the packet, uh, outside of the book kind of things. Okay. So we'll see how this goes. All right. So starting, we were in uh, chapter four. Um, you're talking about like user libraries versus um, system library. And Torin asked um, if using a user local library that you you discuss how to set it up on um, Mac and Linux. If that if switching between um, working as an R user versus an R package developer, if you know of any like issues that that can produce. Um, I guess the only thing I would say about that, and that part of why this is on my mind, is I just. <laughs> officially marked something in, in dev tools um, called dev mode as deprecated. Mm. Um, so I don't, if you haven't heard of it, don't worry about it, obviously <laughs> it's deprecated. But um, uh, when dev tools first came out, I think this was featured kind of prominently. And, and what it meant was like, I'm taking off my data analyst hat and I'm putting on my R package developer hat. I'm going into dev mode. And then when you were in dev mode, it meant um, it kind of temporarily inserted uh, a development package library at the top of the library paths. So that if you installed something kind of experimental and funky, that's where it would go. And then you'd experiment on it and whatever, whatever. And then it wouldn't be polluting your main package library with weird experimental stuff. And then you would go back out of dev mode. So I, I have a feeling that's kind of what the question is getting <laughs> at. Um, I, I think the world has like given us better ways to do this now. So dev mode is officially deprecated. Um, and the way I, I'd say we look at this now is that there's, um, I, I think you should have system libraries, you should have user libraries and like anything that's not part of the base of recommended packages should go in a user library. And then I have just one and it's managed in an extremely sort of expedient haphazard way. <laughs> and then for the rare product that really can't tolerate that level of chaos in the package library, I would use RM. So I would invert it and say that your sort of main user library is kind of intrinsically a place of whatever the current version is, is kind of chasing the current CRAN version. Like you don't wake up every day and update packages, mm -hmm. but it's, 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 it's kind of an, an ill-defined thing. And the places where you really need to not have that level of chaos, you have to identify them and use something like RM and lock that down. So I think it's kind of, we used to think the user library was super important and we need to protect it. And that's why we go do our crazy experiments somewhere else. And I think we now think of it as like your, your main user library is a slightly chaotic place and you're touching it from all sorts of packet, uh, projects and you need to protect the things that need to be more stable with a different workflow. So I just think the world has kind of changed. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if does that answer the question? I think it does. Um, I guess Torin, yes. Yeah, I think uh, so. I... Great. Um, do you work with RN often or? No, not often, That's... but I do have experience with it. Um, my experience has been with collaborative, collaboratively developed like websites or book projects where it's oh, that makes sense. really important. But like even like this book project, like we don't use it. We just, cause we wanna be bleeding edge and we wanna know right. if, um, so I have relatively little <laughs> experience with it compared to people I think who, who really are creating a lot of data products that need to persist and not change in unpredictable ways. And so, yeah, I, 
I totally agree. I think that's where the difference between a user mode and dev mode comes in is if you are working with something that, you know, needs to be super reproducible, maybe you're going to deploy it somehow, not as a package, not as something that's constantly updating, but as a thing that has to be able to run, you can use rnf to lock that in. And then your normal life is the user library, et cetera. Um, oh, so. one other thing I'd say about that, that again, like why dev mode didn't stand the test of time, I think, <laughs> is that uh, load all is so awesome. <laughs> and that wasn't that wasn't necessarily something you could foresee. Right. You, you it's easy to think if I'm really going to develop a package every time I'm <clears throat> kind of ready to see how things are going, I'm going to truly build it. I'm going to truly install it. I'm going to truly attach it. And then I'll play around with it. And it just turns out that load all, which is an abbreviated simulation of that, has such high fidelity for most packages. <laughs> and it's so much faster that, that that's really the way you experiment as you're developing moment to moment. And then, you know, that's not hitting a package library. So it's not creating right. chaos anywhere. So I think, I think that was another like key development. Uh, for sure. It's part of the story I, we're talking about here. Um, yeah, if people don't know, you know, control shift L in our studio is the load all. And I'm working on a system right now that is somehow capturing that hotkey. And I have to figure out how to make it work because <laughs> like I can't load all, then I can't work. <laughs> so. It's uh, driving me crazy. So, uh, all right. So the next up, um, this will, there's a question here eventually. <laughs> so it starts as more of a comment than question. Um, in chapter five, you talk about, um, you reference the uh, Sogi, Nash, and Graves paper about like discovering packages from, um, it was from a USAR conference, I think. Um, and mm -hmm. that brings out, that talks about that the most common route that people actually discover packages is social media, which isn't really a reproducible um, workflow. And so the question I think comes to like, do you have advice? This was around if you're, you know, you're starting your package and you want to check what else is out there. Um, like, do you have advice of how to do that? And part of that is I know, you know, our universe is a thing now that can help with that? Do you have any other thoughts, tips, anything? <laughs> uh, I do still think though, that just going on like a street corner where a bunch of our nerds hang out and <laughs> asking is in a super effective way of doing something like this. So it's true that like the, the lovely world we had for ourselves on Twitter has been substantially dismantled and is is substantially reassembling on mastodon and i don't know think i guess platforms come and go we're all learning that um but there are certainly many friendly slack communities such as this one um so i still think i mean that's the joke right that if you say on the internet oh such and such isn't possible someone will code it up for you in the next hour right so i i think going out into some public space like this and asking like i think i'm thinking of making such and such is there something already in that space it is actually because you get to take the union of a whole bunch of people's knowledge um so i think that is still a pretty good way to be informed if it's already um explored territory and then i also don't I think it's good to know what else is out there, but I don't think that means you can't do your thing. <laughs> That's fair. Um, uh, like, I feel really strongly about that, that <laughs> um, there can be multiple packages in a space and there's just a whole bunch of reasons why that's fine. Um, so. But it's still good to know, like it, you right. don't want to go into something like that thinking like, I will be the first. And then, yeah. and then you find out, like you want to know if you're going into a space that's already occupied and plan accordingly. Yeah. Um, Olivier mentioned in the chat, and I think you did 
do mention in that chapter about um, CRAN views, the, the Zoom chat specifically. Um, but there are, there's CRAN views. There is, you know, our universe had a blog. Well, our, our consortium had a blog recently about how to use our universe to kind of search for things. Uh, there's the CRAN org on GitHub that you can use to like search code um, in CRAN packages for things. There are lots of options, um, but yeah, I will say that right now, I don't have as good of a social media um, option as I had six months ago for searching for things. Um, yeah. But actually, uh, they don't charge for just typing in the search bar yet. And so searching through Twitter um, often can find a lot of useful information still. Um, although the Twitter search can be hard to navigate, but if you work at it, it can have good information. Yeah. All right, so um, we had one, it's it's a fairly specific comment, but I think again, can um, it was a specific question that can be kind of general. In the um, chapter six is the whole package where you um, demonstrate making a package from a script, basically. And um, the question was specifically about would it make sense? There's a whole um, discussion in, in there about like dealing with temperature units and other like US versus UK English and inferring it and different things. And so they were asking about, you know, would it make sense to make that an argument to the function of what type it is? Um, and I think the more general question is like, how do you decide, or do you have any rules for deciding like what's in a, a function argument versus something you kind of are figuring out within the function? <laughs> I guess the thing that that most makes me think of, because um, it came up recently in an internal posit Slack, um, I'm probably gonna mispronounce this person's name, but Francois Cholet um, works at Google, right? Yeah, I think so. Yep. Yep. And I know he's <laughs> kind of famous for like a certain piece of software, but the main reason I, enjoy following him is that like fairly often he also tweets or blogs or speaks about software development practices and he has this great talk on user interfaces and he talks about um that you want to present an interface to your user that like lets them convey their wishes to you in the language that they want to use and it was about like cooking hamburgers right and it's like people want to tell you that they like their burger medium rare and then your package is supposed to figure out like what temperature that means and like what the grill needs to do to get it there but like they don't want to tell you i want a burger that's 114 degrees centigrade two inches from the you know and so I, that's, I think, the best like high level advice on this, which is what does a motivated, sort of organized thinking user want to tell me? Like, how do they want to describe the task? And that's what the arguments should be. And I should be able to figure everything else out from that. And if I can't, if there is some kind of like, fiddly little hairy detail I need to get from them. Like I'm gonna have to document that and like maybe give them a way to figure that out. But but just that principle of like the hamburger principle has <laughs> helped me in many conditions, like think of like, should this be an argument? Or like, you know, I could elicit this information from the user in like three different ways, like which one is best? And then like, I just think, you know, how do they order the burger medium rare? Like that's that's the way to do it. I, I really like that analogy. That's that's really useful. Um, that somewhat relates to there was another question that I think you address somewhat in um, uh, chapter twelve. So this was again from chapter six of um, around like how do you decide what to export? Like if you have a utility function and you talk at a little bit specifically about this, but just any. Um, I don't know, soundbite version of the answer of 
Don't export anything you don't have to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the sound bite version. Yeah. Because someone will start using it and like now you've agreed to maintain it. Yeah, I only export it if it really needs to be exported because you can always export new things, but people get really mad when you take things away. That's very true. Um, we have a hand, right, Ryan? Oh, I, thank you. I didn't see the hand. Go ahead, Ryan. Yeah, I think so. The last question, the chapter five question uh, was was I believe that was mine. Um, yeah, so uh, going back to Olivier's note about the CRAN task view, I, I was kind of involved, uh, not let's say directly involved, uh, but I was supporting one of the uh, new CRAN task views for sports analytics. Um, and uh, I was kind of suggesting here are the packages that I've seen. Here's one for uh, lacrosse, which is not a very common, commonly uh, discussed sport uh, analytically, um, whatever. And ultimately, what they ended up doing is just kind of picking, you know, the top 10 or 20 most interesting or most useful packages. Uh, and the lacrosse package didn't make it onto the list. And so now nobody knows by going to the Cran Trask view that the lacrosse package doesn't, they don't know that it exists. Um, and then, you know, I, I just was checking Twitter numbers and so forth. I, I think I have about a thousandth of the following um, that some of the people here have. Um, and so I can't, I know a lot of people and probably a lot of readers of the book can't hop on to, to Twitter or Mastodon now or what have you and ask, hey, my well-connected group of followers, do you know about a package that does X, Y, and Z? So that's kind of where my question was coming from. Um, yep. Not, I'm not sure that there's Yeah. I think well, if you use hashtags though, there are enough people who follow hashtags that you can overcome um having you know a small number of followers that way like because that's so that's a way of still getting it in front of relevant eyeballs uh another yeah. one is like that's why we have the uh wins in feedback channel on r4ds is if you have something that you're trying to boost on social media post it there and Usually, um, I'll like if if you post a tweet that you're trying to get more answers to, I'll go in as R4DS and retweet it, and then that's ten. I don't know what we're at anymore, but um, you know that's a lot of followers <laughs> that will hopefully see it. So feel free to use the community to to find the community. Um, the R community is very, very, very friendly and very active, and so. Um, hopefully we can help that be a thing still <laughs> you're you're bringing up bringing up the crayon task cues also reminds me of like another position i took at our recent company work week we were talking internally about i can't remember what it was but i came out as being very anti lists um because i think like maintaining a list this is I'm over. This is an overstatement, but it is like it is doomed to fail. Like every time you get into a topic, there's this phase you go through, which is like I shall make a list of the amazing resources on this topic, and it's it's like a useful thing to go through. But then, then either your list is really successful, which is like kind of great, but then other people want to contribute to your list. And you become like the list manager, which maybe you weren't at all interested in being. And then people might suggest things that don't actually fit with your taste. And so then you either have to say no and explain yourself and like now those people are going to be disappointed or you have to say yes, but now the list has become not your list anymore and you're just the list manager and or they become stale because no one's contributing to them or whatever. And so I fundamentally think that CRAN task views suffer from some of these just like intrinsic flaws of list making. So I'm much more a believer in feeds than lists and that you sort of tune in to the relevant feeds on topics you're interested in when you have bandwidth 
you tune out when you don't. And I'm pretty, I don't think there are many lists that really like stand the test of time. <laughs> anyway, I'm skeptical of all of this <laughs> keeping tasks. And I try, I try to like sniff out if someone's asking me to do something and I'm like, this is maintaining a list and I'm not going to do it. <laughs> Every once in a while, I'll look at a CRAN task view for something that I'm working in to see like the, um, I don't know, this other universe of what people think is important in it because it's stuff I hadn't seen anywhere else other than the CRAN task view. Um, yeah, well, when you're new to something, of course, finding a great yeah. list is like a great day. So yeah, it's 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 a mixed bag but then yeah the, the the time comes where you're like not so excited about maintaining the list anymore and then either you have to kill it or you have to let it go stale or you have to like coordinate other people working on it but yeah <laughs> all right uh continuing we're in chapter seven uh which is where we get into the r code of the package components and the question itself this is just it has a simple factual answer of uh Howard asked, why is ZZZ.R, uh, the script that has onload in it, named that way? Is it because R reads in R files in alphabetical order? Which, um, yes. <laughs> but yes. The, the question yes. I would expand that to is, um, like, I, I have seen, um, I can't think of why, but I've seen AAA and ZZZ. Can you think of other things that matter for the beginning or end of a package? load cycle other than on load you, oh well like a common thing to put in aaa is setting up a, an internal package environment yep, yep. okay yep so if you don't want to yeah if you just if you know <laughs> you're going to use an internal package environment to create a back channel for your functions to communicate with each other you want to put it in aaa unless you write a collate field, but I don't usually do that. Um, <laughs> so that you know it exists from the beginning. You don't have to keep track of where it's created. And not that it's very easy to sit down and like read a whole package, but if you do, it's quite common to start with AAA. <laughs> and then you learn, oh, hey, this package has an internal environment that we might sort of use to, to transmit information, you know, to keep some sort of state. Um, I'd have to like look at a bunch of AAA and ZZZ files to see if I could. Um, yeah, mostly I make just in terms of like stuff I have open on my computer right now. It seems to be um, about setting up environments I do have a lot of them yeah it's all it's all setting up environments in AAA okay um all right uh I guess that just before moving on do you like um how much thought do you put into the file name that uh functions are going into and you know, do you have any thoughts around that? At this point, I just almost always name it after the function. So, okay. so then once you <laughs> have some, <laughs> I don't have too many files now that are where there's a debate. It's like, it's usually one function, one file, or there's like a flagship function and then it's little right. helpers are there. So. I think the harder decision, like the package I'm staring at in the background right now is Google Sheets 4 because I have to release it. Mm -hmm. And that's an example of where it took me a long time, <clears throat> long time to figure out a naming convention for the functions. And I, I actually got it wrong. Like, like when I first <laughs> released, I had one convention and then, then it became clear that that was not like sustainable. And then I had to rename everything and that was extremely painful. Um, so it can just be hard sometimes. That's uh, one of but the- Yeah, so I would say naming the functions problems. is harder and then the, <laughs> the, the files just kind of follows from that usually. That, that That's not like an additional difficulty. Okay, that makes sense. 
Um, so we have a question that came from chapter eight. It's uh, not really, I don't think, I don't know why it came up in chapter eight because I don't think it really relates to anything that's in, that's the data chapter. Uh, but okay. the question was um, around uh, what are good practices around when to have, uh, especially for a company to have a private GitHub repo for a package versus making it public? Like how much do you, I don't know, you know, like I know, well, I do know that sometimes there will be a package that even within Posit is being developed private before it's re revealed to the world. I have seen examples where a package comes kind of full formed on the GitHub. Um, so do you have any, I don't know, any thoughts around when to make a package private? I mean, when to make it public, I guess it'd be the bigger step. I, I, I'm all public all the time, basically, <laughs> unless I'm like, really, really flailing about and I don't want any chance of somebody seeing my flailing. But in general, I feel like the struggle is, the struggle is to get people to pay attention to what you're doing. Like I have, I have not heard of anyone, you know, like stealing somebody else's package or, <laughs> you know, someone having a public R package and that like being detrimental to their company or something like that. So I just, it's just, everything's public by default um, for me because there's just, there's so much signal and noise and chatter and whatever. <laughs> like it's, it's hard to get people to focus on you and to pay attention to things you're doing. So I just really don't worry about so so sometimes you know maybe i would put something in a personal account instead of like a tidyverse account while it's sort of incubating but it would still be a public for the most part i'm thinking i bet are you saying is it like the shiny team that has done that sometimes? i think uh, early tidy models did that that i've oh, seen yeah i I don't think that's a work yeah. style there anymore. Okay. Um, I feel like maybe Shiny I, has done it like around the Shiny for Python stuff, for example, right? right? Like that, yeah. that did like incubate. <laughs> um, and it kind of had to like, you, you know, maybe, so that, there are cases yeah. like that where like you're building this big thing, but I don't, I don't work on, <laughs> you know, one gigantic thing like that that is supposed to be have makes quite that much of a splash. So the stuff I work on, <laughs> it's just all public. And there is yeah, a lot I think there are comes, companies. Uh, yeah, to to Olivier's point. Yeah, of course, if your product is your package, right? Then I can understand. But yeah. um, <laughs> or or if it's um. If it has, you know, uh, personally identifying information involved in it, or if it has some sort of, you know, whatever proprietary things that you can't release. But I, I guess, even having worked a fair amount in um, corporate package work, life's easier when you get it public, um, because people will fix bugs for you. <laughs> so, people don't fix bugs for you outside of your company if it's private. Um, are you just explaining things to people and mm -hmm. then you can point to such and such? I mean, I, there's yeah. definitely privacy, like keeping things private adds friction. Um, yeah, and credential things, which, yeah, again, ideally you should have separate management of that, but sometimes that doesn't make sense for whatever yeah. you might be working with, so. All right, um, so then we had a skip that there weren't, well, actually, I think what happened here is uh, chapter numbers kept changing. <laughs> and so we're gonna jump forward to chapter 14 um, where we're talking about testing. And um, the general consensus or general idea of this question is um, how do you decide when to use snapshot tests versus not snapshot tests? Um, I know I personally have felt like sometimes like it's easy to just throw a Snapchat test in and feel like you're testing something, but you might 
you know, it's a fragile test. And so just thoughts around that. Because snapshot tests were a great, awesome addition of 3E, but um, yeah. <laughs> I only use them to um, monitor messages and errors. So, yeah, I mean, I'm sure in all the tests that I own, there's a couple where I'm snapshotting a value, but that's like super rare. So like 99% of the time it's, I have worked hard to craft a very nice message, <laughs> you know, either informational or an error message. And I want to make sure that it continues to like look the way it currently looks. You know, the information is getting interpolated into it the way I meant it to. So, so for me, it's pretty clear when something is a snapshot test occasion and when it's not. You okay. Um, uh, let's see. And then we had, um, <laughs> so yeah, the question as written in the uh, spreadsheet where they were logging things was, this is uh, in chapter 22 in life cycle. Um, Hot single, off the press. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so the, the question they put in the spreadsheet was single, large, or several smalls, which I think meant, um, like, how do you decide versus or on kind of a release cadence of um, uh, what to wrap together into a single release versus waiting too long between releases? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I can't claim that I always practice what I preach, but always <laughs> doing lots of small things is much easier than doing a few number of big things <laughs> like that. And I know I've linked to it somewhere in the book, but like, Thing, you know, if something hurts, you should do it more often. Like that's also true about releasing. Oh my God. So yeah, it's, I think it's definitely a bit dysfunctional to release very seldom and then have like these like monster releases because it's hard on the maintainer. It's hard on the user. So I think the more you can creep up on your major releases, it tends to work better. I don't always do that, but I'm getting better at just releasing more often. Okay. And then that, I don't think that's, so I think that was the question that was actually being asked, but um, reading the way they asked it, it made me um, wonder about, um, like, how do you decide uh, what when to split a package, basically? I think we asked the same question at the last book club with, you know, use this, versus uh, dev tools and, and actually dev tools split off or is like built out of a whole bunch of packages now. Is Do you have any rules, any guidelines on how big to make a package? And there, <laughs> I mean, the answer might be as big as it needs yes, to be. I, uh, <laughs> I mean, I'll just like, I can elaborate on why dev tools got split up is is that there were sort of obvious subunits where in some project like i want to use subunit a and i have no use for subunits b through z and th there were like right. quite a few identifiable subunits that you could say that about so the, i don't know if that's not super concrete but um and then also when there's a subunit that like needs to be released or like that needs a bug fix, like, right, this is bothering people, but I can't release subunit C because we haven't finished this work that's in flight on subunit F. And, and so also there were like the, I think the unwieldiness of dev tools was that like, if you wanted to get a bug fix out for the, I don't know, package loading, you also kind of had to follow, polish off anything else that was in flight having to do with reverse dependency checks or like building a package or do it, and it was just like this big thing and so i think it's when you feel like you are also like struggling a little bit with velocity like if you want to be able to release or move a little faster that you're just not like schlepping all this unrelated stuff around together so those, I think, were the 
the reasons that dev tools got broken up. I'd say another one I have seen is when like one area of the package has dependencies that the rest of the package uh, doesn't care about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah when, especially like you can carve out some of these subunits that are like extremely lean. And then there are yeah. some others, probably the ones that deal with like creating a surface that people can touch that have like a ton <laughs> of dependency. <laughs> um, yeah, that's another really good reason um, to split things out so that you can make some of these like super low dependency hmm. utility packages. All right. Uh, so the next one um, is kind of musing on version, version numbering again in the lifecycle chapter. Of, are there any issues, uh, especially like on CRAN, if like if you switch between say a two digit two digit version number and a three digit version number, or if you switch from one that has hyphens in it to a more standard, uh, you know, just dot version numbers. Do you know of any? any I don't know that of any. Cause? No, I mean it's like aesthetically offensive. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know of any actual problem. So I think as long as is, is if you convert all the package version numbers you're contemplating into those proper um you know package version objects in r as long as like the next one is greater than the previous one i think cran's fine with that <laughs> um so i i'm not aware of any reason why you have to keep using the same system um and yeah, we have pretty strong opinions on what system to use. So I, you know, if you want to get right with God, it's so easy. <laughs> then I think there probably would have to be one transition from whatever the previous system was to this. But I don't think anyone can, uh, yeah, has an opinion on that. What I know of. All right. Uh, so this next one. Um... I, I, I'm very interested to hear your answer. So the book is around like best practices for creating an R package. And it's a lot around, like you've had control of it from the start. And the question was, if you took over maintenance of a package that didn't follow all of these best practices from the start, where would you start? And, and what other, like, what would be different in that situation than what the book yeah. Really covers. So I feel like I've thought about this type of question a lot. Both I used to think about it for data analysis, right? When I was more someone who taught data analysis, because again, like your notions of what you think are good practice change over time. And then you come, you open something from the past and you're like, oh man, like, am I supposed to redo all of this? And I think, no, absolutely not. I think mostly what your your opinions are should inform greenfield work when you're starting something new and then if you have to open something existing i think the stuff that you're touching is fair game for modernization and i guess i have a lot of experience in inheriting packages <laughs> from people but mostly inheriting from like Hadley or Jim Hester. So I don't open it up and find, you know, bad things. I might find things that aren't quite how we do it now, but um, so I'd say the more hairy things are when I revisit something I wrote a long time ago. Um, but I think the first thing where I actually sometimes proactively grit my teeth and like do a whole lot of modernizations is the test suite because having like a very well functioning test suite is what gives you the freedom to tinker elsewhere. So if you're going to like go in and sort of fiddle with something that's technically working, but in the name of bringing it up to modern standards, I think it's the tests where you should start. Cause like it has huge payoff 
respect for what it <laughs> lets you. It means when you want to change one function below the R directory and you're not going to change everything, but you're going to start modernizing, it's having a high quality test suite that makes that possible to do safely. And uh, documentation. So modern, if something is documented in some like really ancient methodology, um, I think converting, like just biting the bullet and like taking the two days or whatever it takes to like convert it to like Roxygen, Markdown, all of that also. And like that is a task that has a beginning and an end, right? Like, and it's fairly hard to like really break things. Um, <laughs> That's also probably a pretty good like hassle to pay off ratio, I'm thinking. Uh, yeah. Ryan? You... Ryan. Yeah. Uh, me again. Um, so just to follow up on your modernizing tests, what are what are the kinds of things that people weren't doing test wise that they're doing now that they're or that they should be doing now? Um I think step one is to make your tests like the, someone else could run your tests. And so usually that means, so something that we really like organized our brains around in this revision is I think, um, I think it's mostly in designing your test suite where it was just getting this realization that in a typical test file, if you used like the the IDE's code folding feature to like collapse everything inside test that ideally you would collapse like the whole file would go like whoosh, 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 whoosh. and there's nothing kind of there's no like loose parts rattling around at the top and in between the tests now sometimes there are and I still have files that are that way but I think like looking really hard at stuff like that so test files that are written like a data analysis script are like the first thing i would try to fix and figure out like why am i doing this oh, well there's this object i need this object okay do i maybe i should write a function that returns that object and then i get to use it in all sorts i can use it on any test and i put it in helper or you know so i just sort of trying to like shove stuff like inside of tests or hoist them up to some higher scope like that kind of making the test suite like easy to run easy to get like dropped into because something's not working and you have to figure out why um that i find has a really high payoff again yeah making the test suite just like super easy to understand because most of the time you're dealing with your test, it's because something is broken, right? Like it's usually not a happy day and like things aren't going well. Um, so designing the test suite for that like bad day when everything's red and like it's just pain <laughs> and it's not working, I think is, um, yeah, makes working on the package feel much better. Getting rid of flaky tests, like then you're like, oh yeah, that just that just fails sometimes, <laughs> like because that's like very discouraging, um, and it undermines your trust in the test suite, which again makes it less useful to you. So I think I think cleaning up test weirdnesses, flakiness, um, non-standard workflow is is worth getting rid of. That that totally makes sense. Um, I also know, like uh, the use this. Um, you know, it's easy, relatively speaking. It's easy to add GitHub Actions. It's easy to add a package down. Um, some of these things that just probably didn't exist if you're working on a particularly old package, you can just use this. Use package down, or was it use package down GitHub Action? And it just works. That was my big thing. Of I um, put off learning package down for a long time because I'm like, oh, it's this whole system I have to learn. And then it, no, yeah. it's like it just works. It's not a whole system you have to learn. If you're happy with the defaults, <laughs> which I totally yeah. am, it just <laughs> works. <laughs> yep. Um. 
so yeah, those like I wouldn't focus on those first, but those are things that exist that are like it's easy to kind of modernize the package because oh look, it has a website now. Um, yeah, things like that. All right, and now I think everything that's left. Um, we had a question that was added that I don't understand. So if you added that question that's at the bottom, um, that's me. That, flush that's that right. out. That's, that's okay. driving development. That's the question we just have, the discussion we just have. Like okay. the, book, <laughs> the book, maybe like you are, for example, in I think it's in the test chapter, you reference an author. I don't remember. I follow him now in Mastodon. I think it's the computer science people that have write a book about refactoring codes. I don't remember his name now, but he's famous. He wrote a book, How Martin, to Refactor Code. Martin Fowler. Yeah, that's him. Yeah. So, so some reference like that, just you quote him. Uh, if we can like just add few references that are good uh, to improve development, like test driving development and stuff, or just refactoring code in the book mm -hmm. or now. I guess I um, should look at my. <laughs> I can't take a picture. I haven't of read a lot of coding books lately. I probably should be. Um, all these goldies are fine. The, pra too. the pragmatic programmer is one that I feel like I got a lot out of. Um, yeah. I haven't, I should be doing more reading along those lines. <laughs> I have I mean I did for a few years and then less right now. Now when I when I read books, it's usually trying to like I, I relearn C like every six months. And so it's something about that. But that's not generally applicable, which is why I have to relearn it every six months, because it's not kind of high level principles, but like pragmatic programmer. And then um well another one, so we actually have a a software engineering book club at Posit. Um, so one that we read recently was The Programmer's Brain. Yeah. Um, I have that one ready to I, paste. Yeah. <laughs> I think that was, um, that led to a lot of interesting discussion. I felt, I felt like some of the chapter chapters like were a bit repetitive, but that was also okay. <laughs> Cause it's still like not a huge book. Um, anyway, it gave me like a lot of interesting thoughts that are, that touch on a lot of things we've talked about here, which is like, try to write this thing so that it's like a low cognitive load for you to revisit and work on in the future. Um, it's like, and so programmer's brain is very helpful for developing personal policies about um, how you're gonna name things. And like, I, I, so that one also, I think had a lot of practically useful information and then i do like the like, pragmatic programmer those are the only things i can think of that i definitely want to put like a specific endorsement out there for i think i spend more time reading like blog posts i think a lot of the things i care about in this space are more blog post worthy <laughs> topics <laughs> We started yeah. a new like series of book book clubs, kind of book clubs, um, inspired actually by uh, the programmer's brain that we read the entire documentation of a package as a book club. Um, because I don't know, it's been so useful. Like we did uh, use this and there were a ton of things in use this that I didn't know were there or I had never actually read all the way through a um, one of the articles and things like that. Um, and then there's another group that's going through the tidyverse right now and they're going through like all of the documentation. Um, and it's Are you finding lots how you of weird stuff? Uh, not, <laughs> not so, well, okay. Uh, we did do test that. I would expect we, that you would. Yeah. So test that has all the other reporters that are in there that that I've led to. I've never understood <laughs> test that reporters. I would be it's not. It's basically not documented, right? 
thing, basically. Not. It's it was it's it is now because there was like the head was missing from okay. the documentation to make it make sense. And so um, but yeah, so that has been actually really useful. I don't remember the principle that she brought up that led me to want to read the, all the documentation, but uh, I don't know, like really internalizing how a function works so you don't have to think about it as much when you're reading the code. I mean, use this isn't really, that doesn't apply there because you're not using it in other code, but um, anyway, so that was a thing that I got out of the programmer's brain is like understand all the arguments so that when you read someone's call that does something that you're not used to you can read it and you know what oh okay i see they're using that argument that i don't use but i understand what they're trying to say um yeah <laughs> all right um so howard asked what's it like to transition from being a stats prof to being a software engineer what were some challenges and is there anything from being a prof that translates really well? Well, for me, it was just, it was an easy transition because I had kind of already started to transition to doing more of this type of work even before I left the university. So it actually felt like uh, the sense of ease where like finally what I'm actually doing and what I want to be doing is what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, so I don't think everyone has that feeling leaving academia, but for me, it was this like just huge like sigh of relief. Um, and no, there's nothing that I miss, nothing. <laughs> Um, and I guess the, the best overlap is, um, teaching. So, so I still do some workshops or giving talks or whatnot. And, um, I still always get nervous and do a lot of prep, but it's also true that like, if you were a professor for, I was like for 15 years. At some point I computed it. I, I've been in front of a classroom with like a lot of people for thousands of hours, thousands. <laughs> and so, so that's handy that um, that's one part of teaching that I've kind of gotten over the freak out factor, right? So you can still be nervous and sort of keyed up and do a lot of preparation or excessive preparation, but that's that's the one thing that I guess I have a lot of experience at that you know still pays off. Um, but I, like a lot of there's like a lot of things that I did as a professor don't aren't actually terribly relevant mm -hmm. to what I do. Like certainly writing papers, right? There's, there's no no analog in my current life. All right. Um, and then I guess these, the last two questions that we have in Slido are somewhat related of what's, what's your setup? Um, do you have, do you work with multiple monitors? Do you use the default RStudio pane layout or do you do something, something else, something funky? Um, and then someone asked, uh, do you miss Emacs and ESS, which would be kind of related okay. to that same concept. <laughs> Yeah, so sort of a how do how do I work kind of thing. So yeah. for many many years, I just worked on my laptop with it in my lap in our living room. Like for several years, uh, once I started at what was then our studio, and then the pandemic came, and I was no longer home alone. But it was my three kids were not going to school, and my husband was not going to work. And like we were all there together and so that motivated motivated me to like actually carve out some office space and then that led to getting an external monitor because like I finally sort of had somewhere for that monitor to live um so now I do have I'm looking at you on a huge external monitor that has a webcam on the top 
And then it's connected to my MacBook Pro, which is off to the right and is always open so that I can use the fingerprint thing. <laughs> and I just leave my calendar open on that. So then I have this one that big display and I do actually use like the multiple desktops slide back and forth. So like I have one that has like a bunch of our studio uh, sessions on it and Slack. And there's one for email and there's one for Git cracking. Like I have spaces. Um, I do all my development in our studio right now. Default everything. I'm, I'm always all about the defaults. I don't have any super special configuration at all. I do not miss Emacs or ESS. I'll, I mean, I always have Emacs open because I got like really good at die red mode back in the day. So basically it I use Emacs now as a plain text editor and uh, as my file manager. So like doing finder type things, but programmatically. Um, yeah, so somehow I never let go of that. And if I ever use another IDE, the one that I've started to use a bit in the past couple of years is VS Code because um, it can be better if you're writing a bunch of C++, even if it's in an R package. Um, yeah, like the <laughs> some of the sort of syntax support is better and for getting into a debugger, it's better. Um, but I'm by no, I'm pretty inept at VS Code. I will admit that like I clearly have not, I don't like to just do pure R work over there. And I know some people do. So like I've probably just not spent the afternoon that I needed to to like really figure out what's going on. So I only use VS Code if I'm working on a C++ heavy package. All right. Well, I think that is all of our questions. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, it has, again, been a pleasure. Um, and uh, we will be starting another cohort very soon. So we may be talking to you again in six months or so um, at a very different point in the life cycle of the book. Uh, and all of us can uh, get those print editions very soon, I think. Um, and we'll look forward <laughs> to that. Thank you. Well, thank, and, thank you again for putting up with my lateness and for all <laughs> these thoughtful questions. And I'm also like super glad that nothing came up that I'm like, oh, I got to rewrite that whole chapter now. Like it was per <laughs> the perfect type of feedback and discussion. So that Excellent. was great. This all was right. fun. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Bye. All right. Bye. 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 Bye.